it's good to know that there's still this much interest in NATO. Uh, uh, and uh, we do have a summit coming up at NATO. Uh, and um, uh, you know all of the speculation in the media about what will be the most consequential part of this summit, presumably, uh, which is not what we're here to talk about today. Um, we're here to talk about the process of uh, adapting and strengthening the alliance's uh, deterrence posture uh, that uh, began, or I should say recommenced, uh, in the summer of 2014 uh, after uh, the annexation of Crimea. Uh, and what I'm going to do is set up uh, the main framework of, of this process as it's unfolded subsequently, set out some of the main questions that are in front of the Alliance today, set out a way of thinking about an answer, uh, and then turn to Yasek to talk about the, the nuclear dimension of this. I'm going to take the broader multi-domain perspective because that's the new NATO perspective, uh, and Yasek will uh, delve more deeply into the nuclear piece. Uh, you know who I am. Most of you know who Yasek is. Uh, but Yasek has joined us as a postdoctoral research fellow for uh, a couple of years. He, he came to us from the Polish Institute of International Affairs, uh, which is one of the main governmental funded think tanks in Warsaw, uh, where he'd been a research fellow working on deterrence uh, for seven or eight years. Uh, and his doctoral dissertation, which he successfully defended last year is a, a comparative look at the experiences of allies in Europe and Northeast Asia with the U.S. nuclear umbrella and extended deterrence. Uh, and some of you may have heard his talk on that subject here at the center a few months ago. So uh, the main question we're both interested in is where does NATO go with strengthening and adapting its deterrence and defense posture? Uh, NATO every decade or so issues a new strategic concept which defines its sense of its place in the world, what's happening in the world, the main factors, the role of the alliance, and talks to some of the main issues in front of the alliance. Uh, the current strategic concept was written uh, in 2010 and endorsed at the Lisbon summit. Uh, but in the process of writing the review, the, the Alliance could agree to some general principles about the role of nuclear weapons, uh, but not to some important specifics. So it punted the issue a little down the road into what came to be a deterrence and defense posture review. Uh, and that process generated a report in the summer of 2012, which said, um, which repeated some language that NATO has often used which is that the, the alliance is committed to maintaining an appropriate mix of nuclear and non-nuclear deterrence capabilities uh, at the lowest levels consistent with the prevailing security environment. Uh, and in 2010, the alliance took the decision to introduce ballistic missile defense against threats from outside the Euro-Atlantic security environment. Uh, and that was added to the mix, if you will. And in 2014, in 2012, I'm sorry, the Alliance said the existing mix then was appropriate without really defining what that might be, but that it was appropriate to the existing security environment. But the Alliance committed in the last sentence of the review to continue to adapt its deterrence and defense posture to ensure that it would remain, quote, fit for purpose in the 21st century. And then less than two years later came the annexation of Crimea. And over that period of time, the significant ramp up in uh, Russian nuclear backed coercion uh, and uh, practice of uh, hybrid warfare activities and practice of nuclear warfare. So the alliance then uh, had to continue to adapt to ensure it would be fit for purpose. There, we're coming up on the third summit since the annexation of Crimea. Uh, at the first, which was a few months afterwards in Wales, the alliance said, uh, well, we're not going to reopen the deterrence and defense posture review. We're not going to rewrite the strategic concept. But we're going to begin the process of adjusting to this new reality. 
And in particular, the alliance put the emphasis on the conventional deterrence problem. Putin's boast at the time that he could have his military forces in four NATO capitals in 60 hours. That required a reply of some kind. Uh, and the, uh, so this was, quote, the initial response, as the alliance has come to call it, to the new situation post-Crimea. Post uh, and then there was the summit two years later in Warsaw, summer of 2016, in which the alliance took account of what it had accomplished in the interim, and it had accomplished a lot to bolster conventional deterrence of the defense in, in the Baltic region. Uh, it offered some very strong language on nuclear deterrence, uh, meaning it recovered most of what it had said before and had stopped saying over the decades, uh, and then also crafted some new language about uh, strengthening um, the nuclear sharing arrangements within the alliance and modernizing them. Uh, and it also then uh, embraced a role for cyber means in the deterrence toolkit. Uh, and it talked a little bit about space, but not very uh, fulsomely. And now as we come up on this uh, summit, there is a debate inside the alliance about where to go with this process. Are we done or are we just getting started? And there are two ways to think about this. Uh, one is to look back at the starting line and, and characterize how far the alliance has come with its adaptations. And in a sense, I've already done that in the last five minutes. Uh, and that's, if you will, a bottom-up approach. And this is the approach the alliance has taken. It's done so in part on the assessment that the alliance would fall out politically over some of the harder things that might be done to adjust the deterrence and defense posture. And that's exactly the prize Mr. Putin is after. So don't go there. Pursue a bottom-up approach, continue to strengthen, adapt incrementally, uh, and the, the assumption is that that's good enough. Uh, and indeed, there are some going into this, alliance, into this summit who would like to declare victory uh, and say, we're done strengthening the deterrence and defense posture. Next question. Migration? What's the next question? Uh, and then there are others who say, not so fast. Uh, because we've only done the easy things. Uh, well, we've done some hard things as an alliance. Fix a, addressing the conventional deterrence problem in the Baltics has been a challenge and continues to be. Uh, but if we're, in, instead of thinking bottom up or distance from the starting line, think top down distance to the finish line, what's the finish line? Here's a starting point for that discussion. Uh, this is... Uh, General Gerasimov's, uh, his, his view is clearer than this graphic uh, would suggest. I apologize that it's fuzzy. It's been clipped and pa pasted too many times. It, it is page 89 of the monograph uh, that you can pick up on, uh, not Yasek's monograph out front, but uh, Dave Johnson's Livermore paper, which we published a few months ago, uh, which is a careful look at how Russian military planners think about thresholds in regional conflict in Europe, conventional and nuclear. And this provides a, um, a view of modern warfare that is the view that NATO's deterrence and defense posture must credibly counter. This, dealing with this is the finish line, it seems to me. Now, what is there about this view that uh, uh, I, I would want to flag for you? Firstly. Russian military thinking sets out thinking about three main levels of war. Local war, think Chechnya, Crimea. Uh, regional war, think NATO, and although they don't write it down often, China. And then large-scale war with a nuclear dimension, um, think the United States. Uh, and in these three different Le these three different wars, three different levels of war are connected 
by choices that we each make to enter them or not. So Russian military thinking, of course, talks about de-escalation. These are, the, this is us choosing to de-escalate, us being the United States and, and NATO, choosing not to enter a local war that would otherwise make it go regional, or choosing in a regional war to back down when we're first threatened, or choosing to not expand a regional war to strategic conflict because our homeland is at risk. And Russian military thinking has gone into great detail about the, the level of, this is deterrent prescribed damage. The word is sometimes just translated dosage. Uh, when we think about deterrence effects, we, we, we talk about uh, putting at risk the things an enemy leadership values and imposing costs on them and, and generating risk. They add dosage. Uh, and anybody who takes prescription medications knows, knows you need the right dosage. Enough, but not too much. What's enough? Enough is to bring us to a decision point. Clausewitz's theory of victory in war is that you can bring your enemy to a political decision point, a culminating point, where the enemy no longer chooses to run the costs and risks of continued war. Russia's theory is that it can bring us to a culminating point by manipulating our sense of risk and cost, but not generating so much risk and cost that we're compelled to escalate. They've created, they, might, they, they worry about the possibility of creating new stake that we didn't otherwise have. So this is a carefully graduated escalation ladder uh, to support SADSIT, a strategic operation to, to destroy critically important targets. Strategic operations being a big organizing concept in Russian military thinking. Uh, and the strategic weapon set referenced at the top includes, well, the things arrayed here, which are displays and strikes with nuclear weapons, non-nuclear strategic weapons, and the things not displayed here, non-kinetic strikes and counter space capabilities. Uh, and in general, there's an escalating ladder here intended to, to go from making us fearful to actually destroying us with everything in the middle. Uh, and so Russian military thinking has put together a set of ideas about how to deter and defeat NATO. This is that collection of ideas. You can't really read these in detail, especially if you're in the back. Uh, but the point is that uh, this, this is to detail each of the decision points going up that escalation ladder uh, and Russia's theory of victory. In, in pre-crisis, Russia can shift the correlation of forces in its favor in both hard and soft power terms while setting expectations for its behavior in war and reinforcing division among NATO allies. Then in gray zone conflict, it can do certain things with hybrid warfare. If overt military action becomes necessary, it can go for a fait accompli. If we choose to reverse the fait accompli, it can raise the cost for us. Uh, if we persist despite those raised costs, they can expand the war in various ways. If we actually counter-escalate, there are things they can do to impose costs on us for that. And if the sovereignty of Russia comes into question, Russia can do a number of things in last resort to protect its sovereignty. It's a collection of ideas, theories. This begins to talk about what a NATO theory of victory would look like in response. Uh, here, these seven points in the left-hand column First of all, for those of you who don't recognize this, this is the ends, ways, means construct by which the US military thinks about the development of strategy. Ends, ways, means. The NATO ends here that I've cataloged line up with that. Things NATO needs to be able to do. It's, its aims as Russia proceeds up that escalation ladder. Uh, to win the battle for the peace, just select the first. How do we do that? Well, we signal clearly the, the stake we have in a Europe whole and free, 
but we set expectations for what we would do in war. And what are the means we use to do that? Well, an updated security concept, explanations of our own theory of your victory, investments in the capacity to outthink and out-innovate uh, adversaries. I'm sorry this is difficult to read, but the point isn't really so much to attract your eye to the individual components of this as to say that there is a way that we can think about countering Russian strategy and that uh, this provides a framework then for asking how far have we come or more to the point how far do we yet have to go as an alliance and adapting our deterrence and defense posture so that it fits this new problem well one there isn't anywhere a statement of NATO ends when it comes to this problem of conflict with Russia. There is no NATO strategy for dealing with the new political military problem of Russia. The most recent statements about the alliance's policy and strategy towards Russia are the ones embodied in the summit communiques and the strategic concept of 2010. Uh, that doesn't make a strategy. Secondly, ways. You look at Russian military thought, it got kicked into high gear by the Kosovo War. Here was the image of NATO doing to Russia exactly what Russian military leaders had been trying to put together for themselves to be able to do, and we were doing it against a former ally of theirs. This gave them high motivation at a time when they had low capability and less money. So what did they do? They threw brain power against this problem. And they spent 10 years thinking about it before they started spending money on it. And really before they brought Mr. Putin around to think of this in the same way. Uh, we haven't done that. Uh, what's a data point? The strategic operations I referred to, SADSIT being one of them, strategic operation to destroy critically important targets, these are big operating concepts that the regional combatant commanders in the Russian military are supposed to use to organize their planning to operate in all domains. And there, there were five of these. I think there are now seven. But the point is they've been completely renovated in the last decade. The closest analog we have to something like that in our system are the joint operating concepts in our joint plan uh, requirements process. Uh, and uh, there are, I think, nine of these. Uh, and one has been written since 2006. And it's an important one. It's about uh, joint operations against um, uh, armed resistance to those uh, to power projection. We have to assume that when we project power in the future, it's going to be a contested process of projecting power, an assumption we haven't had to make uh, since Saddam vividly illustrated the risks of doing that when he gave us six months to build up our forces. Uh, so uh, and the illustration of how little homework we've done in this area is the new edition of Joint Pub, Joint Publication 5.0. This is the guidance that's given by the joint staff to the U.S. planning community to do, quote, full spectrum military planning. Uh, the latest edition has grown to 380 pages. Um, deterrence is used in the executive summary. The word appears in the executive summary uh, and doesn't appear again until Appendix F, 300 pages into the document. Uh, there is a paragraph on cyber, three sentences long. It's the only mention of cyber. Space is not mentioned. Uh, branches and sequels in the planning process are mentioned, but not escalation or de-escalation. Uh, and there's something called the end phase, but that's not war termination. So that's a summary of how the US has so far innovated to think about this new problem. Here's the most recent statement, the most recent depiction I could find of NATO's thinking about deterrence in this new landscape. And what you can see, if you can see this at all, 
is it's all about the conventional balance in the northern flank and a little something on ballistic missile defense. Now, the Secretary General has spoken uh, repeatedly about the all-spectrum, all-domain deterrent strategy of the alliance uh, and keeps talking about the things that are being done to increase that, that posture. But um, compare this just conceptually with the Gerasimov view. You can see we've got some distance to go. Um, let, let me put the Gerasimov chart back up and make uh, a, cu a couple of other uh, arguments. Um, one, one is that, um, well, let, no, let me, sorry, let me go one, so, means. I talked about ends. We haven't put uh, a strategy together. Ways, we're way behind on our homework. Means. Think of this as a, um, this is where we would grade the alliance on capability development. And again, you, ca you can't read that, but if I color coded it, you could see it. Uh, and, and I'd give two of those boxes green and too many of them red. Um, we've done the easy things as an alliance. Now, there are two, there's two arguments in, in, to counter my way of thinking about this. One is, that's the old problem, we solved it. And the way we solved it was by fixing this part down here, so they're not going to go up here. They, they know they're going to be deterred and defeated at the conventional level of a war that goes from local to regional, so they won't start. That's argument number one. The, the other argument that's made is, there's a deal coming. Mr. Putin has discovered that he cannot challenge NATO militarily and doesn't need to because the division in the alliance that he's been after, his core conviction, apparently, reportedly, is that the alliance, the core premise of the treaty was valid in the Cold War and it's not today. The core premise of the North Atlantic Treaty is that an attack on one will be treated as an attack on all. And it was manifestly the case in the Cold War that if 180 armored combat divisions came through the Fulda Gap, they weren't stopping at the Rhine. Everybody had a dog in the fight. Hard to see that that's the way it looks to most observers today. Uh, that Putin could pick a fight with some Baltic country or a NATO partner country and the rest of the alliance would say, where's our dog in that fight? Don't, don't have one. Uh, and now, sometimes it appears we have a president who thinks the same way. And thus, perhaps Mr. Putin already has the prize, and thus we don't need to solve this problem militarily, goes the argument. Uh, I, th I think those are both flawed, flawed arguments, and we can talk about that in, in Q&A. One last uh, set of arguments, and that's about this is about a the alliance's deterrence and defense strategy and posture. And the administration has, of course, introduced a new idea, which is that it's not just about deterrence and defense, but it's also about strategic competition. What, what does it mean to look at this as a problem of strategic competition for the alliance? Not just building a robust deterrence and defense posture, but competing over time to change well, to compete for what? Uh, the administration hasn't very clearly set out what it means by strategic competition. The national defense strategy says compete for, to compete to do what? To continuously deliver performance with affordability and speed. Well, who couldn't argue with that? To expand the competitive space and seize the initiative. To generate decisive and sustained military advantages to impress upon our rivals U.S. strength and the vitality of our alliances so that they, our adversaries, abandon aggression. Or the answer of the national security strategy, overmatch. Quote, so that our sons and daughters will never again be in a fair fight. 
overmatch. Imagine Mr. Putin being convinced that the United States is heading and that we're going to take the alliance with us to overmatching capabilities so that none of this is credible. What's his fear? Well, that we're the ones who are going to launch up this strategy and bring war to him. Um, so the alliance also needs a strategy for not just arms control, but strategic stability. Uh, how do we compete in the long term in a manner that advances our interest, not just in deterrence and defense, but also ultimately in a peaceful settlement of the issues somehow with, with Russia? So that's the broad framework. Uh, my view is that the top-down approach or the turn to look at the finish line as opposed to this, the starting line tells us that we have a long way yet to go as an alliance in making sure that we're postured adequately to deal with this new problem. Now I'm going to turn to Yasek to talk about the, uh, the nuclear piece of the puzzle. Over to you. Thank you, Brad. Uh, so, as Brad mentioned, my uh, presentation today uh, will be a bit narrower than uh, Brad's, as I will focus on uh, NATO's uh, nuclear uh, policy and, and posture. So, I will, today I will make three points. So, first, I will uh, briefly discuss uh, the progress uh, NATO has made since 2014, the, the, the starting point. Uh, second, I will provide some of my recommendations uh, on uh, how NATO um, could react to the U.S. Uh, 2008 uh, nuclear posture review at the, at the Brussels summit, and we'll find out on, on Thursday whether any of these uh, recommendations would be uh, included in the, in the summit declaration. And uh, last but not least, uh, I will talk about the role of nuclear weapons in this uh, overarching uh, uh, NATO's deterrence uh, and defense uh, strategy. And uh, my uh, presentation today uh, is, is uh, to a large extent uh, based on my paper, which I uh, published at the, the CGSR, so the 2008 U.S. Nuclear Posture Review, NATO's Brussels Summit and beyond. So if you haven't get, got your own uh, copy, please please uh, do it after the, uh, the, 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 the talk. Uh, so. Um, so let me start with my take of, on NATO's progress in adapting its nuclear uh, policy and, and uh, posture. Um, so, um, so, so the adaptation process has begun in 2014, but uh, it has become visible only in uh, 2016 at the uh, Warsaw, Warsaw uh, summit. So, uh, in particular, as, as, as Brad mentioned, uh, NATO has recognized a nuclear challenge from Russia and sharpened uh, in its own uh, nuclear uh, rhetoric. Uh, also, what's important, what's important uh, is that NATO has returned to more operational thinking about uh, uh, nuclear deterrence policy after, after almost uh, 20 years. 25 years, and uh, it started considerations about how to build coherence between nuclear and, uh, and non-nuclear elements of, 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 of the mix. Uh, uh, NATO has also begun efforts to raise nuclear IQ among uh, decision makers with some tabled, tabletop uh, exercises to, to prepare them to make uh, timely decisions uh, during, during uh, a, a nuclear uh, crisis. And uh, I would say that in comparison to 2014, I think like today I see kind of a change of mindset in, 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 in discussions uh, and, and, and thinking about uh, nuclear deterrence uh, uh, within the alliance. What I think is, is, uh, is, is good. Um, yet, despite all this, this uh, accomplishments, um, uh, NATO's nuclear adaptation uh, in, in, in past years has been relatively slow, um, especially in, in comparison to, to, to uh, 
uh, conventional uh, adaptation. So when we look at the public discourse uh, in Europe about NATO's deterrence uh, and, uh, def and defense, it uh, focuses mostly on, on the conventional part with little, if, if any, space for uh, nuclear uh, deterrence. And uh, um, NATO has been very relu reluctant to, to, to reopen the uh, 2012 deterrence and defense uh, uh, posture review, even, even though it has become at least like questionable uh, whether some DDPR's uh, conclusions uh, are still valid. For example, that the Alliance's nuclear force posture meets the criteria of effectiveness. Um, and uh, the main reason for this is that uh, within NATO, nuclear deterrence has remained very politically sensitive and uh, recent uh, a treaty on the prohibition of on, on nuclear weapons uh, also added to this to this uh, um, sensi sensitivity, and uh, we also have to keep in mind that since the end of the Cold War, NATO has been on traje trajectory of reducing the salience on, of, of nuclear weapons and changing this this uh, traje trajectory in just uh, four 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 years has been. Uh, extremely uh, difficult, um, and uh, I I would argue that the 2018 U.S. nuclear posture review uh, provides a new impulse uh, uh, to to a debate uh, within NATO about how to ensure that NATO's uh, nuclear deterrence uh, policy and, and posture are uh, fit for uh, fit for purpose, and uh, some of the choices made by uh, Trump administration, uh, they go beyond the adaptation uh, measures NATO has taken since uh, 2014. So uh, uh, I would say that the NPR moved the goalpost when, when it comes to, to, to a nuclear uh, debate uh, within, uh, within the um, alliance. And uh, given the significant, significant implications of the uh, NPR. Um, I think that at the, at the Brussels summit, uh, NATO allies should should uh, somehow react to to to, uh, to, to this. And uh, in some respects, there are reasons why NATO should move closer to uh, to the Trump administration's uh, uh, approach. Uh, and in some cases, I think that allies should seek agreement on slightly uh, different uh, different uh, policies and uh, this brings me to my second point uh, which is uh, about uh, um, how NATO could react to the NPR at the Brussels summit assuming of course that the summit uh, uh, will be will be successful and will end up with with uh, um, consensus-based communique, which uh, I, 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 I hope uh, and, and think uh, will happen. Um, so I think that final communique should include, uh, first, more specific language about the, Russia's, the Russian nuclear challenge, general recognition of US efforts to bolster NATO nuclear uh, deterrence, a clear language on the value on, of, of NATO nuclear sharing arrangements, uh, and reaffirmation of some of NATO's statements on, on arms control and disarmament and uh, declaratory policy. Mm. So first, at the Brussels summit, NATO allies should publicly specify uh, how they understand the role of that, that nuclear weapons play in, in Russia's uh, approach to uh, conflict and uh, one, why, the, why the alliance is, is concerned ab about it. So this would follow the um, US NPR, which was very specific and vocal about nuclear risk create, risks created by uh, Russia. And uh, this would build on, this sh on, this, uh, on, on the 2016 Warsaw Summit uh, uh, communique. Uh, in which NATO allies raised concerns uh, 
uh, about Russia's, quote, irresponsible and aggressive nuclear rhetoric, military concept and underlying posture. The problem is that NATO hasn't been very specific of what does it really mean. Um, and I think that benefits of NATO's clear language on Russian nuclear challenge uh, outweigh any, any uh, potential uh, costs. So uh, my impression is that within NATO there is still a, a lot of reluctance to, to, to talk more uh, publicly about the, the, the nature of, of Russian uh, uh, nuclear challenge. And uh, I think it's to some extent counterproductive because even after the NPR there is still a, a lot of confusion about what Russia is really up to when, when, when it comes to, uh, to, to uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, I think that NATO silence NATO silence uh, uh, can can uh, can actually exa exacerbate uh, Russian uh, nuclear problem. Um, uh, my going to my second recommendation uh, uh, for for the Brussels summit is that uh, NATO should recognize contribution of the NPR's supplementary nuclear capabilities to overall uh, NATO's nuclear posture and I think it would be sufficient if NATO do it in even in a vague and indirect way for example by recognizing the uh, Trump, Trump administration's decisions to, to bolster US contribution to NATO uh, nuclear deterrence uh, posture. Um, so even if some NATO allies may disagree with the US rationale for the uh, supplemental uh, uh, capabilities, so the deterrence capability gap uh, with uh, nuclear deterrence capability gap with regards to Russia, I think still that it should be reassuring to NATO allies that the U.S. is taking steps to increase its uh, self-confidence uh, to, to, to fulfill its, its extended deterrence uh, commitments. And uh, like when it comes to the, the, the supplemental uh, capabilities, so there has been a lot of like criticism from the let's say non-governmental experts in, in Europe with regards to to these capabilities but uh, my impression is that there is like no such criticism at the kind of a governmental expert level especially at, at, at the uh, NATO headquarters so my impression from from my, my visit at the NATO headquarters it was that, that the capabilities were quite quite uh, well received, at least by those people with, with whom I uh, talked to. Um, my third expectation for the Brussels summit is that uh, NATO should provide a positive narrative about the contribution value of uh, nuclear sharing arrangements uh, to the, to the uh, alliance. So um, the nuclear sharing arrangement, so based on U.S. nuclear weapons uh, which are stored in Europe and allies' role in their uh, delivery um, have been the core of NATO collective nuclear deterrence uh, mission and uh, nuclear bargain sharing. And uh, it is um, extremely important that the NPR highlights the importance of this sharing arrangement and somehow highlights the way in which uh, uh, they can be further uh, improved. Um, yet, uh, what I think somehow blurs the, the overall kind of a picture of the value of, of nuclear uh, sharing arrangement is that when NPR justifies the supplemental uh, capabilities, uh, it only highlights scenario in which uh, a use of gravity bombs delivered by dual capable uh, aircraft uh, would not be an optimal option of, of response by, uh, by uh, NATO. And uh, as a side effect, I think it fits into narrative of critics of, of nuclear sharing arrangement who say they, they have no value other from a, a symbolic one. And uh, I think that more can be said about the unique role of DCA and the relationship to the uh, other nuclear nuclear capabilities of the uh, of the um, alliance. Um, of course, when it comes to uh, NATO's collective nuclear mission, uh, a lot would depend on, on 
decision of certain countries to, to uh, modernize the, their uh, uh, dual capable uh, aircraft and it seems that it's still not not uh, uh, not certain mm. uh, my next recommendation is that NATO should continue to balance deterrence priorities with disarmament aspirations so this is, I think, an area in which Trump administration could move a bit closer to, to uh, thinking of some uh, NATO, NATO allies. Um, so the US and 2018 NPR has placed less emphasis on, on, on the role of nuclear dis disarmament uh, in comparison to the 2010 NPR and NATO uh, documents, including the Warsaw Summit. And, uh, Balancing deterrence and, and disarmament aspiration has been kind of a foundation of internal uh, consensus within NATO. And I think that this balancing act can be made in a way which doesn't hamper any efforts to bolster uh, nuclear, nuclear uh, uh, deterrence. Um, and uh, I personally have very modest expectations for the summit with regards to NATO's arms control policy, and with regards to the INF Treaty and non-strategic nuclear uh, weapons. So when we look at the 2018 nuclear posture review, it explicitly referred to the role of uh, R&D on uh, conventional intermediate range ground launch missiles and uh, new nuclear silicons in somehow creating conditions for a meaningful arms control relationship with, with uh, uh, Russia. And uh, I think that there are good reasons why NATO arms control policies should move closer to, 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 to those proposed by the Trump administration, but uh, I'm skeptical that uh, it will, it will uh, happen soon. So there is still some, some time for convergence of, of uh, uh, approaches. Um, um, so, and my last and final recommendation for the Brussels summit is that I think NATO should retain its kind of uh, ambiguous nuclear declaratory policy about circumstances in which the alliance uh, might consider uh, or con contemplate the use of uh, nuclear weapons. I think that NATO is not yet prepared in terms of conceptual uh, thinking like for similar qualifications which were made in the 2018 uh, NPR and that ambiguity has, has been serving uh, NATO, uh, NATO well. Mm. So this brings me mm, to my third and last point uh, of my uh, presentation uh, which more directly uh, links to what Brad, uh, to, to what Brad uh, has, has uh, already said. Uh, so I think that a signal in Brussels um, of NATO efforts to make deterrence and defense fit for purpose would be much more stronger if NATO initiated this process of building this comprehensive deterrence and, and defense strategy uh, that would treat nuclear weapons as kind of an integral part of the of, of alliances multi-domain uh, approach and uh, this strategy building process would, would help to incorporate and it, and if needed refine uh, into uh, and if needed to refine um, into NATO's policy those kind of a NPR decisions on which uh, NATO allies would not be able to, to reach uh, consensus in, in a, a shorter, shorter time frame. And uh, this process could also answer some, some kind of long-term, uh, like bigger questions which, which are posed by the, by the uh, NPR. Mm. Uh, yet, as, 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 as Brad uh, has said, like within NATO, there seems to be no appetite for kind of a top-down uh, strategy building uh, process. Uh, and um, I, I think that perhaps only, only, uh, only a shock uh, could, could somehow 
uh, change that, what, uh, what is not very reassuring. Uh, and otherwise, this kind of a bottom-up incremental approach to, to uh, ma actively manage deterrence and defense uh, posture would dominate kind of a NATO, uh, NATO, um, NATO thinking and NATO, uh, NATO approach. Um, and uh, also, like this kind of a process of building building strategy uh, would, I think, perhaps would not be possible within uh, within uh, uh, NATO without revising some NATO's policy framework, in particular, uh, 2010 uh, strategic concept. And it will not happen until there is an agreement within NATO of, of like what Russia really is. So whether Russia is a competitor, adversary, or like, like we, can, we can think about any different, different uh, adjective, but like within NATO there is really no consensus on, 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 uh, on, on, on that. Um, still, like, even though perhaps we uh, unfortunately cannot expect this kind of an official strategy building process within NATO. I still think that there is a lot of kind of uh, conceptual uh, work which uh, can be done by by like people outside of, of of NATO, and I think this kind of work can, can fit into into NATO thinking uh, uh, sooner 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 uh, or, or later. And uh, and like to address the, the the full spectrum of challenges posed by. Uh, by Russia, in, including in the pre-conflict uh, uh, phase. Uh, I, I also think that this kind of a deterrence and defense strategy should be, should be supplemented with, with, with what Brad said, arms control strategy, the strategic stability, but also uh, strategic communication, uh, communication uh, uh, strategy. Um, so, uh, uh, Quick, 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 quick points of on 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 the the the, the, the three three strategies. So uh, when it comes to the deterrence and defense uh, strategy, I think that NATO should clarify the, the or, or, or we should think about clarifying the contribution of different nuclear nuclear capabilities uh, to NATO's overall deterrence uh, uh, concept. So. Like matching to different ends on 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 Brad's uh, Brad's uh, Brad's uh, chart because I think that still like the the, the role of uh, nuclear weapons uh, uh, is is not uh, not not fully uh, and nuclear deterrence is not uh, fully fully uh, fully uh, understood and uh, uh, also like. I think there is a need for kind of a concrete and cre cre con of concrete steps uh, that should be taken to to ensure kind of a political, military, operation, operational, and institutional coherence between uh, different elements of the alliance uh, uh, posture. And um, if we, for example, look at the NPR, like the the stovepipes in the in the document are are obvious. So perhaps NATO could. Uh, within context of thinking about NATO strategy, we could uh, put different pieces uh, to the, together. Um, second, with regards to the arms control uh, part of the strategy, I think that it could be instrumental in framing steps to bolter, bolster deterrence as a part of proactive efforts to, to kind of shape Euro-Atlantic security architecture in a way, way which is far favorable to to, to NATO, so arms control can play a role in like shaping correlation of, of forces in a way which is uh, which is uh, beneficial for uh, NATO, and it would also help somehow to uh, get a public support or secure a, a public uh, support for uh, for any steps to to bolster deterrence. But for doing that, I think that NATO should continue to be kind of a, the demandor of uh, arms control uh, steps uh, with Russia not only react to, to kind of uh, uh, Russia's uh, proposal and uh, 
to be clear, I think that to be demandeur uh, also means that NATO should should uh, uh, have a political will to invest in a kind of a bargaining chips in in uh, future negotiations. Uh, and last last but not least, uh, so the strategic communication part uh, or, or or supplement to, to this deterrence and and defense. Uh, Strategy. I, I, I think it's uh, extremely, extremely needed. And what NATO allies should do better is to communicate a rationale for nuclear deterrence uh, uh, to the public. And I think lack that lack of public support could uh, undermine NATO efforts to, to to create this kind of a credible. Uh, deterrence, in, including including its, its uh, uh, nuclear component, and uh, it could also undermine an uh, uh, arms control uh, efforts. And uh, to kind of uh, start to 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 to, to uh, or maybe like as an important part of, of of this kind of a strategic communication strategy, I think that uh, um, NATO should be like more outspoken about kind of a. Uh, Nuclear landscape uh, about it, uh, and uh, like nuclear, nuclear, um, uh, nuclear challenges uh, ahead from 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 the alliance. Because like without this sort of understanding of kind of uh, threats, uh, I think it's it's uh, it's dubious that that public will ever understand the need for NATO maintaining. Uh, nuclear deterrence, and I will stop here. And I'm looking forward to, to, to our further discussion. Thank you.